This is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. Welcome back to The Forging Table. The mission of Undaunted Life is equipping men to push back darkness with content that forges spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. At The Forging Table, you'll see a group of regular guys forging spiritual resilience by digging into God's Word, and we're welcoming all of you to come along on that journey with us. Let's go out of order. That's Horn, that's Dagan, that's Winkler. Guys, we are digging into Acts 10, and let's just get right after it. So, Ryan, if you would not mind, let's start out with the first eight verses of Acts 10. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household. He gave alms generously to the people and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa to bring one Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging with the one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and devout soldier from among those who attended him. Having related, related, related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. So interesting thing about this. So a centurion means, you know, you're a leader of a hundred men, but the devout part um, so devout meant that these, these guys feared God, but I guess according to something we see in chapter 11, doesn't necessarily mean that you were saved, but I thought there was an interesting point from the MacArthur commentary from verse two, it said feared God was basically akin to Gentiles that had abandoned their pagan religions and worshiped Jehovah God. And so, because again, if you're not terribly familiar with this you know, time in Roman culture. I mean, they just had a, just an absolute panoply of different gods. They had gods for everything. And then they had a God for all the gods that they may have missed. Right. So, you know, <laughs> you basically have all these things and, you know, a lot of them, part of the problems with proselytizing to the Romans was, Hey, Oh yeah, Jesus, let's just add them. Let's just add them to the menu and, you know, we'll just take it. And it's like, well, no, like this is the God. There are no false gods, but it is interesting to see that this is, you know, clearly a Gentile man that has, you know, kind of turned from the pagan religions underneath Roman rule and, you know, turned to Jehovah God. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. I think one of the things whenever I was reading through this is it's interesting that God sent an angel to Cornelius, who is a Gentile, who, who is a God fearing man, but. For all intents and purposes, the religion that he is following is not welcoming him. It's not welcoming him at all. Right. I mean, he's a Gentile and he's worshiping the God of Israel. Uh, it doesn't work. Uh, and so I think it's interesting. God sends an angel to Cornelius. He does. He, he and to tell him to go get Peter instead of saying like, you know, well, the angel's going to tell you the good news. Now, you're in. Uh, it, it, no, it's not that way. You go get Peter. And I think in a way, I think Cornelius needed to hear that he was clean and welcome into the faith by someone who is Jewish, but also Peter needed to actually go to someone where they were considered unclean and see that they would, it doesn't matter. Yes. Like God's made it all clean. It's all, it's all common. You know, it was, it was like unlawful to be in a Gentile's home. Yep. Mm -hmm. Like uh, mm -hmm. Gentiles could be in a Jewish home, but it was unlawful for a Jew to go into a Gentile's home. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I think was pretty crazy to look at is that God accepts his prayers. So you're thinking of a guy that only listens to the Jewish people, his chosen people, but God was listening to the prayers of a Gentile. I thought he only listened to the prayers of Calvinists. Is that not what? No, is that not part of the, <laughs> no, no. But the Calvinists are the only ones that can know what the right like mm. interpretation so you of the want to start this is. now so you no. shut me down <laughs> last week that's okay and you want to start this now maybe you want to throw it down <laughs> not right now okay it has we'll do nothing to do with we what got, we're doing hey we got plenty hey, of time you know how many times that it had nothing to do with anything and you're like how about this and you just throw a calvinist bomb into everything come on message yeah we're going message. dagan save us hey it's in the hey, bible Dag do you think can we let dagan save us please hush your butt so i i read this first part and and you know I, I admit, I don't think like everybody else. I don't think in a straight line. I'm, I'm a little more scatterbrained, but I'm reading this thinking, had Cornelius heard the conversion story of Saul? Do you think he had heard that? Mm. Because he's a, he's a devout believer and an angel comes to him. And if he knows the story of Saul, right, and has heard of that story, and then an angel comes to him and is like, hey, 
go get Peter. And then like, 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 like wait, that's seriously, like, that's it? it? Hey, well, get you know, Peter. we have to assume, well, first of all, do angels talk like that? That yeah, was kind yeah, of like, that was, was like say, super seductive. I read like, that yeah. in a book somewhere. No wonder everybody has terror. I know. Yeah. <laughs> go get Peter. <laughs> well, go get Peter. Buddy. But like, okay, is there any way that he didn't hear about the conversion? Because again, we have to, there were years that went by yeah. from the time that he was yeah. like chief persecutor of the Christians to now proselytizing. I would say it would be almost an impossibility that I, he had heard, not my heard. My question is, why does it matter? No, I was just curious. It doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah. yeah, I'm just I'm like, not saying it matters. I'm okay. saying I'm curious to think like, you have you you know that story. Yeah. And then the angel comes to you and, and you feel like you're have like that is the moment in your life where oh, you're, you're, like, you're just like, you're just like, yes, Lord, what he says, he, he trembles or whatever. And he's like, uh, what is it, Lord? Yeah. And he's like, go, go to, go, go, go to Joppa Peter. and get I Peter. I see what you're saying. I and he's it. like, I was like, where did they, and then it's like almost connect? crickets in the background and it's like, cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that's my moment. I, All right. Hey, I'll go get him. I, I also like the, 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 the little Google maps directions. The angels giving him here. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's like, he's by the sea. <laughs> by the sea. He's in Joppa. <laughs> Joppa. Uh, hey, yeah. the, the uh, he's, Joppa. He's with some guy named Simon. Uh, he's a tanner, yeah. I think. Yeah. And but, uh, but, but I, I was actually laughing as I was going through this. Cause I was going, this almost sounds like when I asked my wife, like, where exactly is exactly what I was going to say? <laughs> like it's by the Casey's. I feel like I'm listening to my wife give yeah. directions to my right son. This over is the phone. It reminds me of the directions to Shroot Farms where it's yeah. like, if you pass a beehive, yeah. you've gone yeah. too far. It's like, you pass, yeah. bro, drive you to go to the, the Oprah beehive. farm, you've gone too far. It's like, can you drop yeah. a pin? I mean, my goodness, like you're an angel. But yeah, you're staying with S Simon, who's a tanner. Right. Yeah. The good tanner. Right. If you're at the bad tanner's place, <laughs> You're Joppa, taking a wrong turn. Joppa was a city by the sea, and Joppa means beautiful. Yeah, and well. so and so that's where it's like I guess like if you were to go out to that area, that it's like mm. pretty pretty bad looking area around there. But then you go to Joppa, man, it's the prettiest part of that area. Yeah. Now, okay, so. maybe that we need to kind of we can pull together some funds and send you there because. Months ago now, when I asked about, hey, think of the best landscape you've ever seen. Think about the most beautiful thing in nature that we ever saw. And we got people talking about, uh, you know, the, the Rocky Mountains in Canada and, you know, Glacier National Park. And you're like, oh, no. Like, I was at this coffee shop in Italy once. And it was like, no, like, not in the city. And, like, you couldn't come up with anything. Next time that's asked, you throw out Joppa. Just say Joppa and say what Someone it means. send me to Joppa. Say it's it's a no-brainer for me, Can Joppa. you look up, if, look up tickets to Joppa? Joppa. Like, let's see if there's, a, do they have like a sandals, sandals Joppa? Can we, can we send them there? It will, an all-inclusive thing. They got like, an all-inclusive in Joppa. Right. Does yeah. Viking cruises Can, they, can take, they keep me from getting missiles lobbed at me? For probably that? not right now, but you know, <laughs> while you're looking that up, we'll, we'll keep this train moving to one of my favorite sections of scripture here. So Dagan, you get to do the honors here. We're going to get into Peter's vision. So oh, let's go yeah. nine through 16, unless you've already found Joppa. Then we will not. They will pause. I will, I will. Why don't you go ahead and read? All right, let's hit it. All right, Dagan, nine through sixteen. Okay. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet let down to the earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him. Get up, Peter. Kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. Now, for most of us, we can't remember the first time we had bacon. What do you want to bet that Peter remembers the first time that he had bacon? Here's the thing. So uh, a couple of months ago, there was a book. Well, hey, before I get there, do we have some Joppa info? Give us the intel. So, so Joppa is right outside Tel Aviv. So um, if you guys want to send me out there... Uh, <laughs> Guys, we're taking donations. Just put it in the memo line. One second. Yeah, Horn, what's your what, Venmo? Uh, yeah, what am I, oh, what am yeah. I, I'm going to depart. No. Hey, guys. Let's, no. I'm going to sound like one of those Pentecostal pastors right now. I'm like, all right, guys, we need this much Hit it. in 90 days. Right. So if we can get this done by September 9th through the 16th is when I'll go out there. Okay. And it's going to cost... 
It's loading. Drum roll. It's loading. It's okay. Loading. Drum loading. roll. Spinning wheel of death. Yes. <laughs> did we? And did you add in the security costs of like the armored vehicles? That are <laughs> no, I haven't, in and out? I haven't done that yet. I'm just getting the airfare. Okay, just the airfare. This is, this is a right. hotel. Really, just what's airfare, but. really, what's happening is Ryan is actually a super secret soldier, and, and we're sending him undercover to go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. the pastiest white Humpty Dumpty looking dude on this table. That's a, here's the a thing. soldier. You have plenty of places <laughs> to sticker like hair to your body, and there's not like other hair to deal with. Yeah. Right? No, yeah. I mean, I, I can't have a beard like that. It's still loading, man. Your internet's slow. You know, okay. Maybe it's your stupid device. <laughs> okay, right? here we go. All here right. it is. It's going to be round trip, 1200 bucks. 1200 bucks, uh, Guys, I think we can That's swing nothing. that. Send, yeah. And what's it called? The Beautiful City or the what What, what was the name it's of it? It's called Beautiful. It's like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll All right, guys. I'll 232, get there at 535 the next day. It's a 19-hour flight. This is what we're going to do. We're going to do a Sarah McLaughlin style commercial in the arms of an angel. We're going to have like slow panning of just you looking really, really sad. And we have to send you to a place that's beautiful because you Where's were not. The camera? Is it over here? Yeah. Yeah. Right there. You just tell them. You just, <laughs> the problem is, is someone's going to clip that exact thing and create that. Uh, They're you know. like, hey, Horn just did duck face. Yeah. That's okay. His Wait, name's right. Jake Winkler. I thought that I was that's Blue Steel. Be clipping it. I thought that was Blue Steel. <laughs> All right. So at this point, getting back to uh, verses nine through 16. This is rise, kill, and eat. Like this, this would have been so shocking and offensive. But at this point, we're seeing that you know nothing is going to get in the way of fellowship between Gentiles and Jews. No more dietary restrictions. And a couple of months ago, there was a buddy of mine who, a former NFL athlete, a tremendous, unbelievable athlete, and he decided that he was going to go vegan. And I was like, "That's interesting. Like, kind of let me know what was the decision behind that." And you know, seems like he's gotten some you know bad advice about that meat's bad for particular reasons. But that wasn't the argument he made to me. The argument he made to me was, uh, "Well, yeah. I mean, according to the Bible, we should be vegetarians." Mm. And I was like, "Interesting. Where?" Does it say that? Yeah. And so his argument, essentially, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, and I want to make sure I present it as accurately as possible, but it was like in the garden, uh, Adam and Eve were built to not eat animals, that there would not be bloodshed in the garden. And so we were built from the beginning to be processors of non-meat and all of that, which he can't prove that, but that was his argument. But then I talked to Joby about it and he's like, Acts 10, bro, rise, yeah. kill, and eat. Like, you, you got to be yeah. kidding me that you would think at this point that, you know, you, you were going to subsist on beans and, like, lettuce. Does your something. buddy listen to Shane Claiborne? Is that where he's getting it from? No, like, I don't like, think he's that, a Shane Claiborne Is that Claiborne supposed to be guy? like, you know, when Jesus comes back and everything gets turned into Yeah, is he like a Tom Brady you know? fan? Like, he was yeah, an NFL I mean, guy. Like, I mean, like, well, he's trying to bring utopia here already Yeah, his veganism. I, well, it's kind of one of those things. Uh, I, we didn't have as as in in depth of a conversation as I would have liked to really understand his point of view. But I mean, when you get to this, this section, there's so much here because basically if anyone's like trying to say that you are killing animals, animals have rights and blah, blah, blah. And you shouldn't do that. It's that they are beautiful and they are also here to s provide us subsistence, right? Well, and they are freaking delicious. Yeah. Uh, hey, the, the, the our, everything about Christianity would look a lot different if you stopped reading after Genesis. Well, yeah, Genesis I mean, two. If we're yeah. back <laughs> in the garden, okay, I get your point. We're not in the garden. Like sin has entered this world. We eat meat. Yeah, it's we messed delicious, that up. bro. Yeah. Like you've got to figure that one out. Okay, I we got to take a short pause here, but it's it's like it has to do with this. I need to know, not want to know, not I'm desirous of this information. I need to know what everybody's favorite meat meal they've had in their lives. So Ryan, this one should be easy. This isn't like, Hey, what yeah. landscape did you like the most? Yeah. If you look at your that's entire life. Okay. No, 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 that's not why I said it. But if you look <laughs> at your entire life, so it, and it could be any number of things, but if you think about this one particular meal, this is the best meat meal of your entire meat eating career. Who's going first? I'll go first. Hit it. So my wife and I, for our 10 year university, went to Napa Valley wine country and there was this place called Press, and she got it all set up and everything. And um, it's basically like a course meal, um, and they do multiple courses and pair it with wine. And um, they came to the meat course, and it was a beef cap wagyu, mm. and like it was like probably it was like three ounces, four ounces, big, like probably three or four ounces. And it was the most amazing thing I ever had. Like it melted in my mouth like a Krispy Kreme donut. Mm -hmm. Like it Ooh. was, it was mm. so good in the glass of wine. And so I was like, I was like, it's our anniversary. I was like, we can splurge a little bit, you know. I didn't buy any cologne that year, so like, you know, How, I was like, were, <laughs> are you okay? Like, I was okay. Like, you missing? In, 
Yeah. A whole year? <laughs> a whole year. I didn't buy any clothes. Shoot. Just for this moment. Okay. All right. So, which, uh, <laughs> which made it even yeah, sweeter. Which made this even sweeter. I was like, hey, man, can I get another one? And he's like, he's like, I don't know, man. He's like, it's pretty expensive. And I'm like, what are we talking about here? Like, you, wait, wait, the, the waiter said that to you? The waiter said it to me. He's like, it's pretty expensive. You should have said, you don't know me, son. Bring me <laughs> two more. I was like, I was like, wait, oh, how, like how, so how much was it? Man. No, it's going to make me look like a douche. Like no, last because time? what look, makes right. you look like a douche is spending like 500 bucks on cologne. That, that's, that's kind of douchey. <laughs> not meat, not I meat, know. brother. Okay. I, uh, in your eyes, since it's meat, I don't look like a douche. That's um, right. so, but no, so like the guy, like it really wasn't that expensive. Like I've had some Wagyu steaks, like a five and you're spending like 250 bucks or yeah, bucks. Yeah. And he's like $90. And I was like, Oh my, it's 90 bucks. Oh, that's not, and he's like, yeah, man, it's 90 bucks. And I was like, you know what? I think I'll do it. He's like, because you're doing it, I'm going to throw in the the pour of wine for free. Hey. And I was like, cool. You know? And I was like, yeah. I was like, yeah. So I got, I got like, it was actually bigger this time because it wasn't a part of like the menu. So I paid 90 bucks and I probably got like six ounces. Worth it. And dude, worth every last oh, bit man, of it. My wife, I was like, you want to buy it? She's like, no, I can tell you're enjoying Amen. it Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. So She's she, like, you can have some more me. lentils. She loves me that much. So, but yeah, uh, no, it was like a beef cap and like the beef caps, like the top of the rib mm -hmm. eye, man. It's just like the most rib cap flavorful. Unbelievable. Oh man. It was wag. Oh dude. All right guys. Have it fun trying to top yeah, that. It was good. Okay. Well, nicely done. Mine's mine's nothing like that. I mean, I've I've had some good meals. The one that comes to mind is just more of like the experience of like I remember it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And it was at Terry Black's in Austin, Texas, and their beef ribs. Oh boy. I mean, it's like, I mean, they they probably weigh four pounds, and they just you hold you jiggle the bone, and it's like it a just dinosaur bone. It is, and it 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 is just like it like it makes makes you want to cry a little bit as you're eating it, just thinking like it's smoked perfectly. It's just melting in your mouth, but I'm crying right now because I literally did not expect you to say a beef rib. I thought it was going to be a honey baked ham. No. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, know, <laughs> Guys, I, I know I look like a ham guy. Wait, but. wait, wait. For anyone who doesn't know why in the world we spend so much time on this podcast debating ham versus turkey, it's Dagan's fault. So if you've only been here for the last few months, Dagan, well, you can tell him where you used to work while you were in college and yeah, where you so, started all this. Yeah. So like around, you know. It, late October, they would hire like off season, Christmas season people. And, and a bunch of me and my college buddies drove up to Oklahoma city to go to honey Bay ham for like, you know, seasonal help. And we would glaze ham. Some people would do the spiral cut thing, which was, which was cool. I wasn't senior enough to do that. So I glazed it and ruined me, ruined me for I'd ham. Be, but I'd be the size of Christmas. the moon. Every I would be Christmas. the size of the moon if but, I did that. <laughs> right, and so that started the the greatest debate in the history of the forging table, which yeah. is team ham or team turkey. And I got to say, at this point, are we, is it, it's probably, it's pretty even. Well, even was, Chandler split. screwed it over yeah, when golly, he was Chandler like, decided, look, turkey, because of Thanksgiving. Yeah. Everybody says turkey because of Thanksgiving. Like, don't think no. about Thanksgiving. Yeah, what if it's like October the 17th? Yeah. Well, like, not that, that's what turkey. we're talking about. But no. Peter loved ham. He certainly did. He had a dream about eating it. Right. Most people, whoever <laughs> has a dream about like Thanksgiving turkey. So, yeah. all right. So that's a good one, Dagan. Man, obviously I don't miss a lot of meals. Uh, I have, guessed. I know I have a whole, there's the sentimental side and then there's just uh quantity. Uh, I'm going to go first. Uh, my grandpa rug had an old tasty bake um, grill and was a magician with steaks. Uh, every year, my grand, uh, my dad when he it was his birthday he would go and buy steaks from the butcher and then he would make them on the tasty bake and had a whole process for preparing them and ever and i tried to learn it i couldn't i was too young but he had a uh he would always make everybody a fillet except for me i got a big old t-bone all right so amen that was uh so probably that is honestly because basically my sister wouldn't finish her steak I'd get her leftovers. My grandma wouldn't finish her steak. I'd get her leftovers. It was kind of fantastic, but um, that's probably the best just for sentimental. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. So got to give a shout out to the beef sponsor of Undaunted Life at this point, Primal Beef. Guys, I'm, I'm dead serious. This isn't an ad. I'm just saying, like, I've tried a bunch of different samples from, like, some of the other meat delivery companies, and some of them are fine, but part of the problem was is they would... 
they're sourcing it from different farms. And so you can get the same box two months in a row and the meat's going to be completely different. But, you know, primal beef, like some of the best steaks and the first brisket I ever made was a primal beef brisket. So Sucker we made that. Good. Man, for dude, it I took me it the next day. freaking years before I was comfortable, like taking on a brisket just because I was like, man, I don't want to mess it up. And oh, But when good. you get sent a brisket for free, it's like, all right, I'm playing with house money right now. So I'm putting it all on red. And so that, that we, you know, we made it happen, but you did not mess it up. It was good with my, my salad. Man, my man. Well, Hey, you, you gave me a, a lot of good advice on that. Yeah. And then shout out to meet Mitch. He'll, he'll be featured prominently here in a second. I've got a couple of honorable mention. Oh, you get honorable mentions? <laughs> it's my freaking table, bro. This is like, true. I bought the table. All right, so this here are the true. honorable mentions. They'll be quick, but uh, Brazilian steakhouses. Yes, so man. that is built for people uh, like yeah. me because I the majority of my calorie consumption is meat. And so this was like the fourth or fifth time I went. I literally went and took a potty break and I didn't need to go pee. I'll just say that much. And then came back to the table and kept eating. And so I cleared room to come back so that I could eat more red meat. So that's one story. Really, really enjoyed that. Second story, the first deer kill of my life in my mid twenties, uh, wind shot a, a deer. It had snowed that morning. And so got a deer. This is the first time shooting a deer, cleaning a deer. And we literally took the back strap from that buck. And that's what we had for lunch. And when the guy put it on the grill, like it, the, the meat's still obviously still warm. It was like, even like, you know, kind of spasming a little bit. Cause I mean, we, this, this animal had just died. We took it off and that's what we had for lunch. But Greatest Did your vegan buddy make that? Uh, yeah, no, he, he was not invited. <laughs> was um, but my favorite meat story ever. So I had this weird job back in 2012. I, I worked in the MLB fan cave. And so they had like 22,000 oh, people apply. And, you know, you had to be this super fan and you had to create content. You had to watch every single game for the entire season. And so I was one of the nine, nine people that was selected to go there. So a bunch of players, you know, current players and, and all-stars and legends and Hall of Famers and celebrities would come by. We would shoot content with them. Well, uh, that would usually coincide with who was in town to either play the Yankees or the Mets. And so the Royals are in town to play the Yankees. And so a bunch of the Royals players at the time came by. I remember Jeff Francoeur came by, uh, Billy Butler came by, and then George Brett came by. Now, George Brett walks in, and he owns the room immediately. We're in this big studio, a bunch of people in there, and he just owns the room. Big personality. Could not have been a nicer guy. So he and I start striking up a conversation, me and George Brett, and we're just sitting there chatting, chatting baseball and all that. And then we start chatting about barbecue because obviously Kansas City Royals, you know, he's, he's from Kansas City, you know, Kansas City Barbecue, probably the best barbecue of any particular place. That's at least where I would put uh, my my stake in the ground. And he goes, hey, have y'all y'all had any uh, good barbecue in the city yet? And I go, no, we we haven't had any. And the look on George Brett's face is like, wait, what? True concern. Like, he's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Just so I'm clear, you've been in New York City for months and you have not found a good barbecue spot. And I'm like, uh, no, George Brett, I haven't uh, found a good barbecue spot yet. And he stops, he's silent for a second. You can tell he's kind of calculating and then he goes, okay, cool, I'll fix that. And I'm like, I, I don't know what that means, but okay, George Brett. And so I shake his hand and he leaves and it's a great thing. A week later, I get an email from George Brett and it's a YouTube link. And I'm like, I think I'm getting catfish, but I'm clicking on it just in case. So I click on it and it's him in Kansas City with a buddy named Mitch Benjamin, otherwise known as Meet Mitch. And they are making ribs and burnt ends. And they're like, man, you know, George Brett's like, man, I had such a great time at the MLB fan cave. You guys, because it was me and eight other cave dwellers is what they called us. And it's like, y'all were so nice to us. And I was just... When you told me, Kyle, that you had not had any good barbecue when you were in, since you had been in New York, I found that to just be an absolute crime. And so we're making up all these racks of ribs and these burnt ends and we're sending them up to you. So be looking out for another email with instructions. And I am like awesome. flabbergasted. Like what? Lo and behold, I get an email that says, this is when the, the ribs and burnt ends are going to be delivered. All the barbecue sauce will be in a separate a thing. And at the time I didn't know this, but this is meet Mitch's barbecue sauce. I think he's won the world championships of barbecue sauce twice Womp. with this sauce, his womp sauce. Womp. So shout out to meet Mitch and the womp sauce. And that would have been enough, but you get a box in New York, you got these ribs, he's got dry ass and he goes around the corner from the studio is this restaurant. I've already contacted them. They're not open right now, but just go around to the back door, back door, knock on the door, a guy named Vinny or whatever is going to open the door for you. They're going to have the oven ready to go. They're going to warm up the, the ribs for you. So Ooh. just make sure you leave them in the foil and, you know, we'll take care of business so you guys can have Kansas City ribs sitting there in the middle of Manhattan. Mm. Dude, I was like, 
<laughs> like, what? What do you, what do you about do? That? I was like, you're going to tell me the best barbecues in New York City? Because I was about to be, I was about to be like, called Offended. bull yeah. crap on that. The man. answer is no. And it's not. Dude, they had to fly it in from Kansas City? Flew it in from Kansas. I mean, we're talking like overnighted yeah. in dry ice. But it, again, at any point, had he stopped the train of hospitality, it would have yeah. been fine. We would have figured out a way to warm him up. We yeah. Like rednecks, we probably would have put it yeah. in the you know microwave or something <laughs> like that. But, but he's like, no, he went, this is a Hall of Famer. This is a very well-off man. This is a guy that's very highly respected and a a bunch of strangers like he made sure to do this with. And I thought the story was over, but I remembered something. So that year, the all-star game was in Kansas city. So we go with major league baseball. We're at the all-star game, uh, but the night before is the home run derby. And so we're out in left field and, and, you know, kind of the area where a lot of the home run balls are coming in, uh, everything like that. And so who walks into our section, George, George Brett and meet Mitch. So I get to meet nice. Mitch Benjamin for the first time. It's like, Oh, hugs and all that. I can't yeah. believe you sent ribs are so great. Blah, blah. And George's like, Hey Kyle, great to see you again. All right, man, enjoy yourself. And so he takes off 10 minutes later, platters, of Kansas City ribs and barbecue <laughs> came courtesy of Meet Mitch and George That's Brett. Awesome. He didn't say they were coming. They just showed up in our section. Man. So I've been to Kansas City a couple of times and I've gone to Meet Mitch's, you know, I picked up barbecue sauce when I was there, but I actually took some people from work. They were like, they wanted to go to this other barbecue place. And I was like, no, you guys ever tried Meet Mitch? And they're like, no. And I took them over there and they were like, dude, how do we not know about this place? I was Dude, like, it's good. When you, so he opened his first uh, restaurant there called Char Bar, and then he opened mm-hmm. up one here recently where it's just meat, Mitch. So Char Bar's more sit down ambiance, but you're, you know, you're getting ribs and burn ins, but there's also some really cool, you know, drinks and appetizers. But meat, Mitch, the actual meat, Mitch restaurant, that is, you know, yeah. metal tray, yep. butcher paper, how it's many good. pounds of this you want, you yep. know, quarter pound of this, count pound of that. And so shout out I'm if you're ever in Kansas now. City. I know what guys you're torturing say, me. Dinner is coming, dinner is coming. It's, <laughs> it's not gonna it's be not your Mitch. brisket though. It's or not my bitch. brisket. Yeah. You know what? But but uh, sorry, I maybe I should have done this towards the end of this episode, but no, you know, that's, we do have a, that, that story is unbelievable and I don't doubt for a for a second that the meal that you ate in New York was like life changing. But the story yeah. Like it, oh, the yeah. meat could have been terrible and I would have been like, these are the best yes, ribs right. I've ever eaten. Like that's an these unbelievable, are ribs. unbelievable story. Yeah. I mean, cause you got to think that year I met, I mean, hundreds of current players like, so, but it was just such a unique thing. There's so few things like that where you could tell that somebody actually gave a crap. Cause some people are like, okay, I need to turn on the charm cause cameras are rolling and these, these people are going to be mm-hmm. in these videos and I don't want to come off looking like a douche. The only douche we met all year was Brandon Phillips. He's an absolutely horrible, reprehensible. <laughs> terrible <laughs> human being. You know what? I'm calling Brandon Phillips out right now. This is what Brandon Phillips did. I straight up told MLB, I was like, if any of these two guys come to the studio, make sure I'm not here because I'm going to have a problem with them. Brandon Phillips, Nigel Morgan. I don't want to see those guys. Problem was, is because Brandon Phillips uh, got into a little uh, kerfuffle with uh, Yadier Molina. It had ended up ending the career of Jason LaRue because there was a big uh, fight between the Reds and the Cardinals and Johnny Cueto ended up kicking Jason LaRue in the head with his spikes. He got such a bad concussion, it ended his career and it started with Brandon Phillips, but Brandon Phillips was on the docket to come. It's like, I'm a professional. This is my job. You know, I'll just, you know, whatever. But he sees that I'm wearing Cardinal stuff and he sees that I'm wearing a Yadier Molina Jersey, which I wore on purpose, uh, hoping that he would say something. <laughs> I will admit, but then what? he, yeah, you know, just kind of instigating a little bit. Yeah. And then he goes, Oh man, I'm gonna rip that Jersey off you and wipe my butt with it. And I was like, okay, all right. This is like right when he walks in. So I'm like, I can't be around this guy. I got to be on other parts of the studio. And luckily I wasn't going to be in the video with him. It was going to be the two female cave dwellers. Well, Brandon Phillips proceeds to, cause it was supposed to be kind of a puff piece thing. And the girls are like, Hey, Brandon, you have a lot of followers on Twitter and you know, we're building our Twitter profiles and things like that. You know, what do you think that, that we should do to, you know, kind of get the same followership and engagement that you do? And he goes, show him your tits. Sorry to anyone who's like watching that. I didn't this give is you a warning. man's podcast. This is, yeah, it's a man's podcast. So he goes, show him your tits. And he thought it was hilarious. And I heard so it trashy. and I literally walked over to the MLB executive. I'm like, if he doesn't get out of here right now, I'm going to flip out. I'm going to absolutely sure. flip out. I cannot believe that y'all are just letting the cameras roll after you said that to these two girls. This is so unbelievably disrespectful. Yeah. Get him the hell out of here. So he was the, the biggest douchebag that we had, you know, the entire time that we met. But when you see someone that takes extra effort to remember people other than themselves, yeah. another example that year was Miguel Cabrera. So Miguel Cabrera, one of the best uh, players of this generation, uh, you could put him, he's probably in the top 50 best players of baseball ever, argument for top 25, whatever. This was the year he hit for the triple crown. 
Okay, so mm. the Triple Crown hadn't been done. So for, for non-baseball fans, that's where you have in your league the highest batting average, most home runs, and most RBIs all in the same season. And it hadn't happened for like 40 years or something like that Sneaky before mantle. that. Yeah. And so this is a year that Miguel Cabrera did it. So Miguel Cabrera comes in early in the season, and he comes and he does his video, this goofy video that we have him do, and he meets all of us. And this is Miguel Cabrera. Like, he literally meets people all the time. You know, like, he's just that guy. Well, then fast forward to the All-Star game. We all see him at All-Star press day and he comes up to us. He's like, oh, Kyle, what's up? Fan cave. And I'm like, this is really weird. Like this guy's on an absolute heater. Well, fast forward to the World Series that year. The Cardinals blew a 3-1 lead in the NLCS. So I'm, I'm pretty sad that the Giants came back. Here we are going to the World Series and I can't see my Cardinals. But the World Series that year was the Detroit Tigers, who Miguel Cabrera played for versus the San Francisco Giants. And so we get to the World Series and we go to Media Day for the World Series. We see Miguel Cabrera and what does he do? He, in the middle of answering a question from another person, goes, Oh, hey, hey, Kyle, fan cave, what's up? <laughs> and I'm just like, Bro, you just hit for the triple crown and this is game three of the World Series. Why are you talking to me? Like, so it's just like, it's cool to see guys like that that don't have to awesome. go out of their way to make you feel special, especially because it's like, I'm not a kid. Like, I, I don't have cancer. Like, I'm not like a, you know, someone that you have to, you know, wear an armband and represent it. Hey, I'm going to hit a home run for you. I'm just a dude doing a job and you go out of your way to make me feel special. It's like, dude, shout out Miguel Cabrera. Screw Brandon Phillips forever. <laughs> I'm not bitter. I'm not bitter. Y'all judge me all you want. I kind of have that same story with Bob Stoops. Okay. Well, we're in story time of the all show. Right, so let's talk about Bob Stoops. So Bob's, I, my dad was doing a golf tournament with a uh, golf event with uh, Reggie White and Keith Jackson. I think I was like 17 at the time. Uh, I have alopecia, so that's why I don't have any hair. I've been bald since I was like, 14 years old. And so, um, I'm my job basically at this thing is just to pick up players and bring them to this golf tournament. So I finally get done with doing that. They get the, the scramble going and, uh, Bob Stoops comes over and starts talking to me, just talk to me for like 45 minutes, asked me a lot about myself and everything. I was like, man, Bob Stoops is like the nicest guy I ever met. And then I hear other people, they'll be like, man, Bob Stoops was like, not a nice guy. And I was like, dude, I have a different experience. Mm. This guy was really nice. And like this other guy popped up and he was like, yeah, like Bob Stoops will go after each game and go sit at like Oklahoma, uh, at Sooners, the cancer ward with kids, Yeah, the children's hospital, the children's yeah. hospital with cancer kids and just hang out with them. And like he would make players do it and he would do it. No cameras, then, no, nothing. no cameras, no nothing. And then I thought about it and I was like, damn it. He thought, you oh, he thought oh, <laughs> oh man. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, oh bro. Talk to no. me because I look like I didn't do. Oh. I didn't sense the twist at the end there. I yeah. didn't sense Dang. it until like almost like 20 years later, man. So, I was like, yeah. when I heard so that he story. might be a douchebag, but nah, he just thought you were is. a cancer kid. Yeah. But yeah, no, he was a good story. Really nice to me. Yeah. That's but like I a Shyamalan it. twist right <laughs> there. At the end. I thought he was alive. Wait, wait, he was dead the whole time. He's like, oh man. He was probably like, oh, then he's going to watch this and be like, that dude, that alopecia yeah. wasted 45 minutes of my I time. Know. That was nice to be like, oh man, good for Ryan. He's still out there doing it. <laughs> that is fantastic. Well guys, we do get paid by the verse, so we probably need to get back into Acts 10 here. So I don't know who read last. So whoever wants to pick this up, Winkler, you're getting pointed at, so it's going to be you. Let's hit 17 through 33. Now while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the spirit said to him, behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them in to be his guests. The next day he rose and went away with them. And some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. And on the following day they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met them and fell down to his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I too am a man. And he talked with him. He went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection 
I ask then why you sent for me. And Cornelius said, four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. So I sent for you at once, and you have been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. So a very important section there. If we can go back to verse 23, Ryan, you mentioned this actually earlier on this episode. So he invited them in to be his guests. This seems like a throwaway line, but it is so, so unbelievably important because Jews at this time did not welcome Gentiles into their home. So just by virtue of the fact that he extended an invitation, he certainly extended way more than that as well. Yep. Great point, Kyle. You nailed it. Let's move on. So, all right, I'll move on to my next point, you freaking jerks. All right, verse 26, uh, where Peter lifted him up saying, stand up, I am to a man. Like most of us, and I would certainly include myself in that, you, the temptation for hero worship for people that, you know, are like, you know, slobbering on you or like treating you like you're different. Um, it's got to be enticing. And I love what, what Joby ha, has said about this before, because, you know, obviously he runs a big church. He's written two fantastic books. He's got a third one coming out this year and, you know, his profile is really exploded and expanded, but not because he's buying ads on Instagram and not because he's, you know, trying to, you know, go speak at all the right conferences. So more people will take selfies with him. Like he's just a dude that's actually being a pastor that just happens to be doing a really good job and God is, uh, you know, showing favor to him and his ministry. So when people come up to him and start, you know, heaping praise upon him, right. he's very big about just saying, Hey, thank you so much for saying that. As opposed to being like, man, you're right. I am awesome. Like, this is incredible. And he tries to be like, I'm just a dude. I'm just a dude. I'm just a dude. And guess what? After he preaches on Sunday, he spends time with the family, drives out to um, the retreat center that they have for Church of 1122. And he wakes up in a, in a, and goes to a deer blind in the dark on Monday morning. And he sits there with his Bible app open. And he says, God, they're your sheep. I'm just a shepherd. What do you want to say to your sheep? It's mm-hmm. pretty awesome. That's that's humility right there. So I've totally stolen that. People are giving me compliments about the show or about something that I've done, a speech that I've done. And it's like, mm-hmm. man, thank you so much for saying that. And the other thing that I try to do whenever people, you know, come up to me, because I've even done some Zoom calls here recently and people are like, dude, I'm like starstruck to even talk to you. I'm like, man, you can stop with all that. I'm going to turn my camera off so you don't, so you can't look at me just like being goofy. But I'll ask them. And I always say this. I try to ask six questions about the other person before I will answer one about myself. And so it's like, dude, how, how, you know, if they come to one of my speeches, like, dude, you know, who, who brought you here? Did, did you, did you come by yourself or were you invited? Oh, so are you from around this area? Okay. Well, you know, what about the talk was even interesting for, for you to want to show up. Do you go to this church or do you go, you just kind of like, cause I'm showing genuine interest in them. I have to listen to their answers so that I can formulate my next question. But that's a good thing that Peter is showing us how to do here. And he's modeling it. You did that to me the first time I met you in ABF. Did I? Yeah. You just kept asking me questions. I was like, Hey, that guy's nice. He kept asking me questions, but <laughs> I had the same moment when, yep. you know, a couple weeks back we had Chandler on. And so I got up here, I was the first one up and Chandler was sitting, I think right where uh, Winkler was sitting no, I had to sit there. He was just sitting there. But um, he, I go, man, this is on my bucket list. <laughs> He's like, you need a new bucket list, bro. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, I was like, and then these, and then this jerk like throws me under the bus no, later that night, or was it my wife? I don't know who it was. Yeah, it was me. Yeah, it was you. <laughs> Yeah, he goes, yeah, that guy didn't like you. you know? Yeah, <laughs> so we're all Chandler hanging out. Like, I'm like, Chandler, I'm like, yeah, the dude over there, he didn't like you. He, he was not a fan. And it, he had to be converted into being a fan. And you were just like, Kyle, why'd you say that? Because yeah, you always get on me. You're like, try not to fight with them the first 20 minutes you meet them. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. what you did with Joby. And it's like, God, you can't take you freaking anywhere, can I? Well, but it, it can kind of feed the monster, right? Like this guy, you know, you got Chandler sitting here and he's all humble. And it's like, yeah. oh, no, I like you even more. Like, yeah. right? It's like, you're, you're who you need to be. Later in Acts, we see like Herod using yeah. compliments for his yeah. own political, oh, yeah. and yeah. we see what you, we see what happens when you do that. Yeah. For spoiler, yourself. Alert, spoiler alert! No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so I, I think the um, one of the other things that Joby talks about is I I like the you know the thank you is is great and all that's necessary. Sometimes we'll have somebody. It's like okay, well. Oh man, that was amazing. The speech, you know, that was amazing. Now, if you respond as like, you know, that was not me, that was just the Holy Spirit working through me, you know, and, and 
it's almost a false humility. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's I also, weird, it's gross. weird. Yeah. And I would also say, uh, I mean, I think it's, it's almost a disservice. I mean, when people are coming up to pay you a compliment on something that you've done and then you're just like, you know what? While all credit does go to God, let's be clear for you to verbalize. Well, all credit goes to God here. I mean, it's not me at all. It's, it's the Holy spirit speaking through me. On the other side of that coin is this person who just complimented you and they're going, uh, man, when is the Holy Spirit going to do something like that for me? Yeah. Yeah. Or, or they start looking at their gifts because gifts are not a difference in their level of important, their difference in their level of sexy. And so if you have the gift of right. like singing or something like that, that's a sexy skill, mm-hmm. but then you have other people that have the gift of organization. And so the fact that there were even chairs in that room for y'all to sit in, like during <laughs> yeah. that service, yeah. thanks somebody who's freaking organized and can like look at a building and know exactly how many chairs need yeah. to be in a row, the logistics person, those types of people. And so, yeah, when you, when you're up on stage, that that's what I tell people all the time. I'm like, don't treat me any different just because I'm up on stage with a microphone on my face, wearing all black. Like that doesn't make me different. That's just my job. It's like, your job is very, very important. And you were put in a particular place at a particular time to do a particular thing for the mission of God's work here on this planet. My job just happens to be a little bit different. The fact that you tune into me on your phone doesn't make me more special than you. Okay. And like, that's just a very important thing for people, but you know, it also comes to us and, and Ryan, I'll get you in yeah. here in just a second, but also it's incumbent upon us to not worship other people as well, where we build these preachers up in our minds, or we build these singers up in our minds, or these athletes or whatever. And then when they're not exactly as we expect them to be, we're disappointed or that was the thing I realized working with major league baseball. I was like, Oh, most of these guys are just dudes. These are dudes with an unbelievable skill set, and they make a ridiculous amount of money to play a child's game, but they're just dudes. A lot of the guys would come hang out like they would play and then we we would watch all the games. And so the West Coast games didn't start until 10 o'clock Eastern. So guys would get done playing the Mets or the Yankees. And then like the entire bullpen would come hang out at the fan cave because it was the only place where there wouldn't be fans, where they didn't have to worry about people taking pictures or asking for autographs because we weren't allowed to do that there. So they would just come and chill. We'd order pizza and, you know, just kind of hang out. And so mm-hmm. just treat people like they are, which is just people. They may have a unique job, but they're just people. And that's a great point. Cause I just want to bring up, like we treat these people, we put them up on a pedestal, but they're not going to be perfect. And, yeah, and when they fall and when they fall, you can't let your salvation go with it. So yeah. you've got to know that you got to be secure in your salvation and who your first love is, which is Christ. And then these people are just there to hopefully disciple you along the way. So for sure, for sure. All right, let's keep Acts 10 rolling. So Ryan, I think you are up. Let's do 30, 34 through 43. Three. Okay. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that the that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is accept, acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is the Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that. He did both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to those of us who had been chosen by God's as a witness who ate and drank with him and who rose after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is one. He is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead to him. All the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Okay. So we don't, we don't have all the time in the world to, to really dig into this, but this section, I'll admit, was a little bit confusing for me. Um, so when you go back to verse 34, so Peter opened his mouth and said, truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. And then in the margins, I wrote, except to his elect, or yeah. what about the Israelites? And so. then literally later on in verse 41, <laughs> not to all the people, uh, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses. And so inherently in these comments and even in just the narrative of the Old Testament and and up to this point, as we see in the New Testament, 
it seems very clearly that God does show partiality. So I'm not trying to be heretical and say, well, I am Peter. He's, he's talking out of both sides of his mouth here. But it, it just was confusing to me. So he shows par- they, they shows no partiality. Partiality is because mm-hmm. the Jews were the chosen people. And so if you were if you were not a Jew, the Jews viewed you as somebody who was unclean and that God would never touch. And so now that he's bringing Gentiles in shows that he is, he ha- he shows no partiality. And so when he says that, he goes, truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right, does what is right and is, and is acceptable to him. See, I take this a different, I, I mean, and maybe this is what you meant. So, I'm looking at it when he says he shows no partiality. I think he's talking about his judgment. I don't know if he's, because to me, it's not like, well, I chose Israel and then I changed my mind and now the Gentiles are in. To me, when they talk about not showing partiality, it's I show no partiality in my judgment. Essentially, God God judges everyone the exact same way, that his justice is universal. Yeah, his justice his justice is universal, but his righteousness isn't. Expand. I don't Expand. understand so, that. So, like, this is truly like. Same. So, so you talk about the elect, okay? Um, truly, I understand that God has shows no partiality. You're talking about His judgment, so He's going to judge sinners no matter what. So, what happened is through Christ, He, he Christ is a propitiation of our sin. So, the Jews would think that Christ and the Messiah or the the second coming that uh, Isaiah talks about is only for the Jews, but it's not true. He's for the world, just like John three sixteen. for God so loved the world. He gave his only son. And so the world is everybody outside the Jews. The Gentiles are the world because the Jews viewed themselves as a, as a chosen people. Does it still not make any sense? I, I get, get, I get, get your get, point, okay. but, um, that it's not quite landing with with how you no. say. So Gentiles are the world. They're right. In, they're everything outside the Jews, and so the Jews viewed. So Peter would have viewed Gentiles as unclean. That God was never going to save them. Right. So you're looking at this in a Calvinist lens, and you shouldn't look at it in a Calvinist lens. You should look at it as Peter is a Jew who believes everything outside of Judaism is but, unclean. But he's saying God shows no partiality. Right, saying that's God he, shows no partiality. God shows no partiality based upon Jew and Gentile anymore. Not anymore, because again, I would say I don't think it's an anymore <laughs> statement because because I would say, does God change through Christ? Does God, God change? Though? God doesn't change, but the righteousness was done. Like so, if we look back at Abraham and we look back at everybody, they were saved by their belief. Mm-hmm. Okay, so now we have Christ Jesus, who is now the propitiation of our sins. Mm-hmm. So not only he didn't just die for the Jews, even though throughout the Old Testament, no, the Messiah was there for the Jews. And so that's that's what was said to them. And so now what, what he's saying now is that the Messiah is for everyone. That's where John 3.16 comes in, that for God so loved the world, he gave his only son. He gave his son for not only the Jews, but the Gentiles as well. Yeah, so I'm 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 tracking with with Ryan here, you know, I'm, I'm looking at two different translations of, of 34. One saying, Peter, Peter says, of a truth I perceive, which is kind of like I'm, I'm understanding differently, right? He's perceiving. And then this other one says, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, right? So it's like Peter's awareness of what God's plan now is, right? Like it's... Okay. Does His that plan, make sense? Like the Messiah isn't just for the Jews, so, like, if you if you go back and look at who they're preaching to, and we'll, we'll even go in this in other chapters, but they go and preach to the Jews. And then you're going to see in the other chapters that while they're preaching to the Jews, there's the Greeks that start listening, and they start God starts opening their eyes to what they're hearing. And so they become believers. And so basically what God is saying here is that we always view the Gentiles as unclean. They are no longer unclean. I show no partiality. It's so, almost kind of like he needs to justify, like, I'm this— it, like I'm um, a Jewish guy in Cornelius's house and they're all looking at me and I need to start this conversation by going, okay, so here's why I'm here. But the other yeah. thing is too, is now okay. when we, we, we kind of miss this when we went back, we didn't go too in depth on uh, Peter's dream, 
But in Peter's dream, it's showing that Christ gets a rid of, or Christ pr- pretty much is a perpetuation for ceremonial law. God's moral law is still there. The Ten Commandments are still there because that is God's true nature. That is that is where God stands. But the yep. ceremonial law, which created uncleanliness, which the Gentiles would have been viewed as uncleanly because they didn't follow those laws, well, they don't need to anymore because the Jews don't need to anymore because of Christ. And now Christ is opened up for them to have a way to the Father. So yours, <clears throat> would it be fair to say that you're saying the statement about God showing no partiality stops short of election? I mean, I don't view, I, I, to be honest, I didn't sit here and view election and want to talk election when I was making my notes here. But I mean, this is something we can go and talk back further. <laughs> well, no, like, I have other time. notes. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I have other time notes to too. Think about an election. <laughs> We've never talked I mean, about it before, but, so let's no, peel but, off the But band-aid. I mean, like, I wasn't thinking election when I'm reading this, but like, you know, God does chose he chose certain people that were going to be there christ chose who he was going to talk to so the the main subject of this is now the gentiles are being etched into the tree that's what the main subject is it isn't like hey i've elected these gentiles these are the only gentiles i'm going to elect uh, does election play a process in my mind yes it does you know later on but that's not the point he's trying to make right now that's why I'm asking if you think this statement stops short of the discussion of election, yeah, because it, obviously within now that, okay, great. We bridge the gap between Jew and Gentile bridge gapped for forever because yeah. the propitiation of our sin debt yeah. via Jesus on the cross. But God certainly, at least in Calvinist theology and parlance does show partiality because he only is going to save well, the people he wants. Yeah. Correct. Well, he shows partiality anyways, because <laughs> whether you believe him or not, when he's you- not going to save you. So like, if I'm going to go off of your, your thought of free will, well, he's still showing partiality because you're using your free will not to believe in him. And so is that really wrong? Is he showing partiality because you choose not to believe in him? So he's not going to let you into heaven. You know, like you could still make a case for partiality there. The, the, the case that I'm making is partiality. There's like partiality before it even comes to my de- decision because a Calvinist would say, well, no, you don't decide you're, you're either elected. You like, God foreknew, and that's the problem with most of the hangup with the Calvinist theology is that there's a difference between foreknowledge and forcing of did, something. Did God f- foresee and foreknow that when he sent Christ, he was going to save Gentiles? Yes, I believe that. I believe it was predestined, if that's what you want to hear. I think that the passage in this, the specifics of this passage here has nothing to do about predestination and everything to show how Gentiles are being etched in to God's promise. But what about verse 35? But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable. So every nation. So what was the Jewish people? What were the Jews? Were they a nation? Yes or no? At at that time? Yes. No. Jews were a nation. Not at that time. Yes, they were. They were conquered by the Romans. Well, they were conquered by the (laughs) Romans, but they were still their own nation. And so they viewed themselves as a nation. They still lived under a theocracy. They had the Sadducees. They, were, they had the Pharisees. They were a people, but there, there was but not they a viewed Jewish themselves nation. themselves as a nation. They may not be a nation in the fact that they had a piece of land and were a nation. They viewed themselves as a nation. And everything outside of their nation was Gentile. And so what he's saying is... I, Jews are just not the, na- they're not the only nation anymore. I am now opening this up to all nations. So it has nothing to do with election. You sure? <laughs> I, 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 I didn't promise. read it and want to go into a Calvinist argument with you guys on this. <laughs> you so always I was not do. prepared. You're always hey, ready. Dude, I try to get you ready. when you're not prepared. It's more yeah, fun. You always try to get me when I'm prepared, and then you no, sit me with all the Armenian guys. No, I don't think anybody would put their self in that cap, but you, we're giving Armenian. you an opportunity to learn how to calm yourself and I just know. have a discussion with people. That I'm just, having a discussion. Remember last time we had a discussion like this? You like pouted and ran, and I like you said, you're, and yeah, ran. and you were like, I don't want to come back. I quit the forging table. I almost did. Yeah. I don't want well, I don't want to redirect the That was my the, own pride. I don't want to redirect everybody's ire here, but I agree. I read it the same way that okay, Ryan thank did. You. Oh, how dare you, I Dagan? Know, get out of here. Dagan's not a Calvinist. Shame. So but <laughs> I quit the fortune table. <laughs> but I, I, I don't wanna I don't wanna like bury the headline here because when I'm reading this, I'm picturing Cornelius and his family. And they're listening to Peter recount his you know, he's telling his story of yeah. what he witnessed. And can you imagine like the jaws in that room just being on the ground? Yeah. yeah. I, I'm, I mean, I'm tracking with what you're saying. I'm just, you know. You just like to give me a hard time. I do. It's all good. <laughs> you guys I mean, get, like I, to get me all track, worked up. Hold on. I should say I'm tracking with what you're saying now. Basically, okay. it's more like it's, as Dagan was putting it. It's more like Peter coming to this realization, not necessarily that he is speaking for God. It's more of a 
But he is speaking for God. But but he's but he's 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 explaining, hey, I'm here, right? Because because I now realize that you were part of God's plan of why Jesus right. came, and then let me tell you like, about what but happened. These are the first Gentile converts. Yeah, like literally, like he, Christ, yeah. like first Gentiles Christ, to be baptized. Christ came to to Paul in the earlier chapter in chapter nine and said, and he told mm-hmm. Ananias, "You're going to be my vessel to the Gentiles." And so now Peter is opening up the Gentiles my or he's opening his mind to the Gentiles because again, I think somebody brought up the fact that he was Jewish and he was under kind of his like own Jewish traditions and everything. Mm-hmm. So like you know, he has to change his mind on a lot of things too and this is how God's you know, having him repent on his partiality because beforehand like he said to God in the dream, "Oh, I don't I don't eat I don't eat unclean or uncommon things." And so he views the Gentiles as uncommon, as dirty. And so that's where he's trying to say, mm-hmm. Hey, if they believe in me, no matter what nation they are, I, I'm here for them. I, no, I get it. All right. Well, let's wrap up here at the very end. I just wanted to make sure that we could get Orion all hopped up on <laughs> adrenaline <laughs> and nothing else. So good, good to see. And we can always see because the redness just kind yes, of spreads right, across yeah. your chest and everything like that. Let's yeah. wrap up Acts 10. Let's do 44 through 48. Are you up? Digging? Mm-hmm. Digging yeah, up. I got it. All right. 44 through 48. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. So interesting thing about that, again, you know, we added chapters and verses later to make it more readable and more, you know, accessible and referenceable. But I feel like this section, you know, foreshadows a little bit of uh, chapter 11 and certainly foreshadows Galatians 2, where Peter, you know, started showing favoritism to the Judaizers and, you know, was like, hey, yeah, yeah, you know, Christ and all that, but also uh, get circumcised and, Mm -hmm. you know, follow the law and do all those different things. And so anything on this last section before we wrap up? I think we can talk about that next week if we want to go back to this section. Yeah, we can hit that next week. Yeah. I think that'd be a good thing to, to talk about, Dagan. The, the only thing I had is is from what I was reading, this is about 10 years after Jesus' death. Yep. Okay, so 10 years after Jesus died, Peter's still holding on to this Old Testament law about, you know, so it just really hit me like, man, God is a really patient teacher. <laughs> And we should be more be, like that, right? Huh? Like, like that's exactly so what I thought. With people, so impatient, and this yeah. is Peter, right? And like, and and it took ten years to go through, you know, for Peter to get to this point where yeah. the Gentiles were part of it, right? And we're seeing this with Peter, and then when we get into chapter eleven, we're going to see it with the Jewish Christians of the church. Like, he's going to go back and tell them this story and watch, like, you right. see the reaction the first time, and then you see the reaction after. It's pretty cool. Well, guys, that's your trailer for next week. We're going to leave Acts 10 there, but we're going to come back here next week and dig into Acts 11. But before we do that, we are going to do a quick resilience boost. As you know, by now, the mission of Undaunted Life is equipping men to push back darkness with content that forges spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. And also, just want to let you know, we're going to do a quick resilience boost with the Forging Table Starter Set. So guys, if you want to do your own forging table with your group of guys, but you don't know what you need to get, we have put together a five-book set through Crossway that you can get for half off. It includes a fantastic men's study Bible, a journal, a devotional, a couple of very, very good reference books. So you can use the promo code and get half off there. But also we are uh, partnered with Logos Bible Software, the most powerful Bible software on the planet. So if you want to take your Bible study to the next level, make sure you do that, but don't do that at full price. Use our link here in the show notes so you can check that out for yourself. And also we are donation-based ministry. So if you're wondering how you can support us in our work to equip men around the globe to push back darkness, just hop on board and be a monthly donor. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Wherever you're listening to this, please subscribe, rate, and leave us a positive five-star review. If you want me to come speak live at your event or on your podcast, just shoot me an email to info at undaunted.life. That's I-N-F-O at undaunted.life. Follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook and check out our website for everything else, including how to donate to keep more content like this coming your way. Just go to www.undaunted.life. And as always, we want to thank the band Holy Name for allowing us to use their music for our content. The music on this podcast is their song Perpetua, which is off their self-titled debut album on Face Down Records. The links are in the description. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Remember, keep pushing back darkness, keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical resilience, keep seeking the Lion of Judah. <laughs>